Hello everyone. Thank you for choosing me uh, over Netflix. <laughs> I hope you won't regret it by the time I finish. Today we're going to discuss seriously, seriously disturbed people, people with personality disorders. And within personality disorders, we are going to discuss a subgroup known as Cluster B. Cluster B has another name, it's also known as the Erratic Personality Disorders. It even has another name, it's known as the Dramatic Personality Disorders. And the reason it has all these names is because people with Cluster B Personality Disorders are shockingly erratic and dramatic. So, there are four personality disorders in this cluster. But before we go there, what is a personality disorder? The very phrase personality disorder makes two underlying assumptions. One, that there is such a thing as personality. And the second thing is that this thing, personality, can somehow be disordered. As if all personalities are ordered and structured and some people are disordered and chaotic and probably in politics. So, personality disorders are patterns, patterns of dysfunction uh, across the lifespan that are rigid. They cannot be modified or they are not amenable to modification or intervention. There are two books books that help us diagnose people and make a lot of money. The first one is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association. The second one is the International Classification of Diseases published by who else? The WHO, the World Health Organization, an arm of the United Nations and the Illuminati. No, I'm joking. There's no Illuminati. Don't take me seriously. I'm joking a lot, by the way, throughout my lectures, so you need to be really on your toes to see when I'm serious and when I'm not. Sometimes even I don't know. <laughs> okay. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was first written in 1952 at the request of the insurance industry in the United States. Pharmaceutical companies in the insurance industry insisted on classifying mental health disorders creating lists of criteria so that they can reimburse therapists, psychologists, and other GISs. So that was the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it was a hefty 100 pages. Today's edition, a mere 70 years later, today's edition has well over 1,000 pages. Either we all became 10 times more mentally sick or there's a game going on. Now, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 5, text revision, which was published a few weeks ago, actually, is a, is a curious hybrid. It copies verbatim the fourth edition, and yet, at the very, very end, where no one is likely to ever go, <laughs> it says, actually, the DSM-4, the fourth edition, is wrong. We should think, we should reconceive of personality disorders as something on a spectrum or a dimension, not categorical, not according to lists, but something that can go from zero to hero on some kind of a line. So this is called the alternative model. And here's the problem. The alternative model of personality disorders has nothing to do with the diagnostic criteria in addition four which are copied into edition 5. Consequently, for many personality disorders, we have two ways to diagnose, according to the DSM, we have two ways to diagnose, which have nothing to do with each other. Absolutely nothing. The ICD is much more advanced because it is not subject to special interests and to money. And so the ICD actually, uh, edition 11, edition 11, which Theoretically, it should be published next year, but actually has been already published in 2019. 
Edition 11 actually unifies all personality disorders, something that I've been advocating for well over 30 years, unifies all personality disorders into essentially a single clinical entity with emphasis. So you'll be diagnosed with a personality disorder with narcissistic emphasis or antisocial emphasis. That is exactly the reality in therapy. I treat people. When you're in clinical settings, this is exactly what's happening. No one is pure. There's no pure case. And people switch between various personality disorders in the same volume. So you don't have a pure narcissist. Usually you have a narcissist who is also antisocial, a psychopathic narcissist or malignant narcissist. Or you would have a narcissist who is a bit dysregulated. So there will be a comorbidity of narcissism and borderline. It's always a mixture of something. It's always Greek salad. And there's transitions. There are transitions between the various personalities. So you could start working, start off working with the narcissist, and then under stress or pressure, next time you meet him, he is literally a borderline. It's extremely common. Any practitioner would tell you. So there are four there are four personality disorders in cluster B, but remember. These differential diagnoses, these distinctions, are very artificial. They're counterfactual. They're useless to a large extent. Even, I would say, extremely misleading. Now, the four personality disorders in cluster B are, according to order of grandiosity and megalomania, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. The extreme form of antisocial personality disorder is colloquially known, colloquially known, not professionally, as a psychopath. A psychopath is not a clinical term, despite what you were led to believe. It's not accepted by the Committee of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, let alone a sociopath, which is totally hype. Okay, but there are extreme antisocials, and we would call them from now on psychopaths because it's easy, everyone knows the word, and because it sounds very frightening, and might or not, and because I promise you the equivalent of Netflix, so. <laughs> I'm going to focus on two of these, and I'll explain to you in a minute why. The reason I'm going to focus on narcissistic and borderline personality disorders is because I don't think the other two are actually disorders. I don't think antisocial personality disorder is a mental illness at all. I think it's a tendency to defy society contumaciousness, resentment or rejection of authority, defiance, reactance, in your face, my way or the highway, you know. But that's a character, what used to be called character before psychology attempted to become science. Psychology is a pseudoscience, but don't tell anyone. So, before psychology attempted to pose as a science, we, we had words like character and temperament. You can find in all textbooks. Character, temperament. Yeah, it's a character. It's just a guy, usually. Usually it's a guy. Who doesn't like the way things are. He is a law unto himself. He doesn't listen to anyone. He disobeys. He's reactant. In other words, he defies, he is reckless. All this is very bad, especially for the psychopath, but it's not a mental illness. It's what we, what we would call perhaps culture-bound syndrome. Syndrome that society rejects. We can even think of settings where psychopathy is advantageous. For example, the military, or maybe policing. Not to mention politics, of course. <laughs> or surgeons. There's an overrepresentation of psychopaths among medical surgeons. Among chief executive officers of Forbes 500, 5% are psychopaths. That's the famous study by Hare and Babiak. 5%. That's five times the incidence in the, in the general population. So it seems that psychopathy is an adaptation, often, often negative adaptation. These people end up in prison. Or positive adaptation in certain settings, but it is an adaptation. 
in my view, not a mental illness. Similarly, histrionic personality disorder. Histrionic personality disorder, I think, was invented by a group of Victorian male, males, Victorian white males, who really dislike it when a woman flirts and is a bit coquettish and seeks attention and so on and so forth. They really don't like that because they feel it's threatening. So they created the diagnosis of histrionic personality disorder. Give me a histrionic any time of the day. So I'm excluding these two so-called disorders because I think they should be hotly contested. They do not, in my view, constitute a mental illness or a clinical entity in any sense of the word that I know. That leaves us with narcissistic and borderline personality disorder. Now you all can go online and find a million videos and two million pages about when I started I was I had the only website. 1995, when there were still dinosaurs in Budapest, I had the first website on narcissism and for ten years I had the only website. But now there's an explosion. Everyone and his dog is an expert on narcissism. And especially the dog. So it's not a big problem to go online and find all the information that you want, and that's not what I'm going to do today. I'm not going to give you a list of criteria. Um, you can ask questions later, which I will ignore, but still. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a list of criteria, and I'm just going to, I'm going to introduce you to some new thinking about these disorders. So a narcissist, um, I don't know if it's acceptable in good company in, in Budapest, but a narcissist is a glorified way of saying asshole. <laughs> it's a jerk. Um, a borderline is essentially emotionally dysregulated and we are thinking of replacing the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder with emotional dysregulation disorder. The key feature of borderline is emotional dysregulation. She is unable, she, because until recently majority of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder were women diagnosed, of course, by men. And so, I'm mean, going to use she, but today it's 50-50. 50% of diagnoses today are male and 50% are female. Maybe because majority of psychotherapists today are female. <laughs> so, uh, the borderline is overwhelmed by her emotions. Her emotions are like a tsunami. She's carried away by these emotions. Consequently, she can't control her behavior. She has no impulse control. She acts recklessly, a process known as acting out. She decompensates. Her defenses collapse, including internal defenses, against this wave that she can't, she can't surf. She can't surf this wave. She drowns in the wave. So this is emotional dysregulation. It's a key feature of borderline. We'll discuss borderline a bit later. And in your questions, you can ask about borderline. It's my favorite topic. Now, I'm going to introduce you some new ways of looking at it. And a lot of it, a lot of it is my work, but a lot of it became main mainstream over the decades because I talk a lot and people get so bored that they say, okay, okay, you're right. And it goes mainstream. So, narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder are the outcomes of early childhood trauma, early childhood trauma and abuse. We know this because we have correlation studies, for example, the famous ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is the biggest in history. So we know that there's a strong correlation between early childhood abuse and trauma and late life, later in life development of narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. Now, BPD for short, <laughs> otherwise the lecture will be six hours. BPD for short develops, can develop as early as age 12 and can be diagnosed as early as age 12. NPD should not be diagnosed prior to age 18 and that's because there is a phase in adolescence which involves very marked grandiosity and a decline in empathy. In other words, adolescence very often resembles narcissism. So we should never diagnose someone before the age of 18, and the new revision would say that we should never diagnose someone with NPD before the age of 21. So it's okay, I qualify. Now, the 
if, if we have a common etiology, etiology is causation, that's cause. If we have a common etiology, and it is so overwhelming, because we can find nothing else, by the way, it's the sole factor that appears in all the cases, or almost all the cases, the sole factor. We do have a genetic component in borderline. There is a genetic influence in borderline. If you have a borderline relative of the first or second degree, the chances of developing borderline are five, are five times higher. So there seems to be a genetic component. There is brain abnormality in borderline. Brain abnormalities, they have been well documented. So it seems that there are other factors that influence borderline, but the only factor that is common to all borderlines, without exception, is childhood abuse. And especially, actually, sexual abuse in childhood about 40% of the cases. So, if this is the case, why, why insist that these are personality disorders? They resemble, to my mind, a lot, post-traumatic conditions. So I'm beginning, I started about 25 years ago, I started to look at these disorders as the outcomes of trauma, post-traumatic conditions. And then there was a woman, Judith Herman, and she came up with the concept of CPTSD, complex trauma. Complex trauma is a trauma that is the outcome of repeated exposure. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is when you're exposed to a single event, an airplane crashing, a lecture by Sarvakni. You know, <laughs> these are traumatic events, and very few people recover. So, this is PTSD. But Complex trauma is if I were your professor and you would have heard many lectures, that would have been complex trauma. So, Judith Herman, the mother of the field of complex trauma, is now advocating openly um, to eliminate the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and to replace it with complex trauma. I've been saying it long before Judith Herman, but it doesn't matter. All good hands on deck. So, yes, I agree. I think these are post-traumatic conditions. Why is this important, all these semantics, splitting hairs? And what does it matter how we call it? That's what I would do. The reason is very simple. We don't know how to treat personality disorders. That's the dirty secret of psychology. We are actually extremely bad at treating personalities, with very few exceptions. There were Ironically, one of the exceptions is borderline personality disorders, where we have DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, which is very efficacious. But otherwise, we suck at treating personality disorders. Not so with trauma. We are very good at treating trauma. The prognosis for treatments of trauma, therapies of trauma, prognosis is excellent, actually. So if we just, if we just reframe, if we change the way we think about narcissism and borderline, and we begin to pay attention to the trauma aspects, maybe we can help these people. It's not semantic, it's not a semantic argument. It's a very, very crucial argument. And should we make this switch, I think we'll be able to, to help a lot more people than, we've, than we're doing nowadays. When, we say, when I say that these conditions are post-traumatic, I'm talking in effect about three aspects of trauma. I and other scholars are talking about three aspects of trauma. The first one is known as dissociation. The second one is known as attachment, attachment style problems, problems with attachment. And the third one is known as dysregulation. These are the three aspects of, I mean, there are many other aspects. But within the context of NPD and BPD, these are the three critical aspects. I will now review each and every one of them, even if you don't want me to, and then we, we move forward. Let's start with dysregulation. Dysregulation is the most visible aspect. When you, when you come across a borderline, she is likely to display dysregulation even on, in daily interactions. You may misperceive it as anxiety, and very often borderline, people with borderline personality disorders are also diagnosed 
with anxiety disorders. But a lot of the so-called anxiety that the borderline shows in day-to-day -day interactions, do you want coffee? A lot of this is actually not anxiety. It's kind of emotional dysregulation. Borderlines, for example, are triggered by words, locations, smells, very much like Marcel Proust, remembrance of things past. You know how the book starts? He walks across a house and there's a wafting smell of cookies, Madeleine, Madeleine cookies. And the gates of memory open. This is borderline. By the way, it was a very interesting case. It was easily, he stayed at home all his life, he was sick, and so on and so forth. But if you read his work, it strikes me a lot like as a borderline. Anyhow, so borderlines are triggered all the time. It doesn't take much to trigger a borderline. But dysregulation is a, is a permanent feature of the borderline. Now, dysregulation, dysregulation pushes the borderline. And when I say the borderline, also the narcissist, but in a bit of a different way. The narcissist is also dysregulated. The difference between the narcissist and the borderline is the coping strategy. How the borderline copes with emotional dysregulation and how the narcissist copes with emotional dysregulation is different. This difference in coping strategy defines the disorder. Another reason to think that these are not actually personality disorders, but different reactance modes to trauma. Okay, we'll come to it in, in a bit. So, when, when you're dysregulated all the time, you have two options. One option is to harm yourself. And I'm kidding, I'm not, I'm not joking, <laughs> I think. One option is to harm yourself. So in borderline, for example, we have phenomena, phenomena like self-mutilation, uh, suicidal ideation, suicidal actions. 11% of borderline, people with borderline personality disorder successfully commit suicide. 11%. It's a wild number. What is the reason to self-harm or self-mutilate? Several reasons. One of the most important of which is to drown out the dysregulation. It's like the famous torture method in the Turkish Ottoman police. Those of you who have never been to the Turkish Ottoman police. So, what's the way to, what's the way to cure a headache? Is, yeah. So, the borderline self-mutilates and self-harms in a variety of ways, by the way. Sexual self-trashing, for example which is very common with the borderline, is a form of self-harm. Even, I would say, teaming up with a narcissist is a form of self-harm. Even, I would say. An extremely common type of couple, first described by my good late friend, John Lachkar. So, there's a lot of self-harm. The self-harm drowns the dysregulation. You know, if you have a headache and you beat your hand with a hammer, for a, for a minute you will forget the headache. Try it at home. So that's function number one. Function number two is to feel alive. The borderline feels dead. The narcissist also feels dead. There's an emptiness inside, first described by Otto Kernberg and others. Um, later, it was known in, in the object relations school in, in the United Kingdom, they called it the empty schizoid core, country, and others. Yes. So there's an emptiness, there's a, black, there's a black hole, there's a void here in narcissists and borderlines. And so when, when the borderline self-harms or self-mutilates, she comes alive, she suddenly feels alive. And there are other reasons. So this is one option, how to cope with this regulation. The second option is to outsource the regulation. We call it external regulation. The borderline says, you're my intimate partner, you will stabilize my moods, you will regulate my emotions, you are my stable rock, you will never abandon me. So this is externalizing the regulation, outsourcing it. In a minute we will see that it leads not always to favorable outcomes, but this is a solution. So we have internal regulation, and external regulation. Internal regulation via self-harm, 
and external regulation by outsourcing of the of inner functions and inner processes to, for example, an intimate partner. The master. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. This was an example of this, example of this regulation. <laughs> Your apology is temporarily accepted. We shall see about it later. So the narcissist also um, chooses the same two solutions. Narcissists are very self-destructive. They are masochistic in many, in many instances. They self-sabotage. Um, it's well known that you give a country to a narcissist, it will end up with pandemic and an attack on the capital. Yeah. So, narcissistic stories end badly, and they end badly because narcissists are self-defeating. Self it's a form of self-harm. Similarly, the narcissist outsources regulation. The narcissist wants or seeks attention from other people. He wants narcissistic supply. This attention is used to regulate the internal environment of the narcissist, especially his sense of self-worth. So, both the borderline and the narcissist are doing exactly the same. They internally regulate via self-harm, and they externally regulate by outsourcing regulatory functions. The narcissist by seeking attention, the borderline by seeking a stable presence in her life, who will never abandon her. However, this produces anxiety. Why? Whenever you are dependent on something or someone, you are anxious, even if you don't feel it. If you are dependent on the government, you are anxious. <clears throat> um, if you are dependent on, on your spouse, you are anxious. If you are depend any dependency creates anxiety. End of story. Now, the twin mechanisms of regulation create twin anxieties. One of them is known as separation insecurity. Separation insecurity is commonly known by self-styled experts on YouTube as abandonment anxiety. That's not the clinical term. The clinical term is separation insecurity. But it's also known as abandonment anxiety or separation anxiety. Yes? Second anxiety is known as engulfment anxiety. So we have twin anxieties which correspond to the twin ways of regulating the internal environment. What is abandonment anxiety? The fear of being abandoned. What is engulfment anxiety? The fear of not being abandoned. Engulfment anxiety is when the borderline, for example, feels that she is merging with her partner. Her partner is digesting her assimilating her, consuming her, subsuming her, and that she's gradually vanishing into her partner without a trace. This is engulfment anxiety. So the borderline constantly pendulates, she's like a pendulum, constantly pendulates between approach and, because the approach, when she approaches the intimate partner, her abandonment anxiety goes down. But then, the partner reacts, he is loving, he is caring, he is, he, is, he is all over her, and she feels engulfed, she feels enmeshed, and she wants to run away. And this is avoidance, approach avoidance. We'll talk about it a bit later. Twin anxieties exist also in narcissism, of course. Everything I'm saying. Everything I'm saying in this lecture applies to narcissism and borderline, but in different forms. In different forms. It's like zebra and horse and mammals. Yes, but one of them has stripes. Last time I wrote. So, the twin anxieties reflect a reality, and now really it's a different part. So, Try to focus. I will give you a cue when you need the chair. Okay? <laughs> the twin anxieties produce 
uh, 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 they reflect a very interesting reality, which I take credit for. I was the first to describe. And this reality is this object constancy versus introject constancy. I'll try to explain. Object is you. It says a lot about psychology that people in psychology are called objects. Object relations. Yes? Okay, because we are nice people, psychologists. <laughs> so, object constancy is the ability to maintain a stable representation of someone in your mind when they are away, when they are absent. We develop object constancy as babies if mother is a good enough mother in the language of Winnicott. Yes? So if mother is good enough, we would tend to trust that mother would be there even when she leaves the room. At the beginning we won't, and we cry a lot as babies, those of you who remember. And then gradually we learn that mother leaves the room, but she also re-enters the room, unfortunately for me in my case. So, <laughs> so we develop object constancy. We learn to create a representation of other people in our minds. And when they're away, we interact with this representation. We feel safe. This, this, this concept is called a secure base. We have a secure base in our mind. This representation of another person in your mind is known as an, an internal object. Now, we have various types of internal objects, the most important of which is the introject. Introject is the outcome of a twin process known as internalization, introjection, or together identification. So, an introject is simply, how to put it, um, a voice. The voice of mother, the voice of father, important peers, role models, teachers, gurus, etc., etc. In, these voices are in your mind, they speak to you all the time, and they stand in for these people, even when these people are long dead, for example. So many of you still carry arguments with your dead mother. It's very common. Now, object constancy is a precondition for appropriate attachment. We'll come to it in a minute. My, my contribution was to suggest that while there is object constancy and object Inconstancy, object inconstancy, is when the mother is not good. She is what Andre Green called dead mother. Not really dead, but like emotionally dead. So she's depressive, she's absent, she's selfish, she's narcissistic, she's uh, withholding, she's avoidant, she's this kind of mother. The baby cannot develop uh, object constancy because mother is unpredictable. Mother is capricious, mother, mother is arbitrary, so the baby doesn't develop. And this is known as object inconstancy. So we have object constancy in healthy people and object inconstancy. My contribution was to suggest that the exact same thing happens with introject. We have introject constancy and introject inconstancy. And I proposed that what happens in borderlines is that they are unable to maintain introject constancy. When the other person is away, the introject of that person inside the borderline's mind fades, disappears. That's why borderlines are very hysterical when it comes to the physical presence of their intimate partners. The borderline insists on the physical presence of the intimate partner. And when the partner is away on a business trip, Talking on the phone, shows interest in another person, male or female, doesn't matter. The borderline falls apart because she cannot maintain a stable representation of the intimate partner inside her mind. Her introjects are unstable, not constant, so they fade. Every therapist will tell you that when you work with borderlines, you tell them, take something of your husband if she's married. Take something of your husband, take a, a kerchief, take, I don't know, his, his eyeglass case, take something of him when you go out. And when his introject begins to fade, touch it. 
just touch it as a stand-in for the button. Because we've come across cases, I'm sorry to say, where borderlines ended up having sex with strangers because they could not maintain a stable introject of the husband. <laughs> they simply could not remember the husband at that moment. They, they struggled to recall the face. And I'm not talking after two years of separation. I'm talking after two hours of separation. Is that bad? So, in borderlines, there's introject inconstancy. In narcissists, there is object inconstancy. And they are mirror images in this sense. I mentioned approach of avoidance. Borderlines approaches, and then she avoids. I hate you, don't leave me. That is borderline sentence. Um, and I mentioned that this is the this is the outcome of uh, the twin anxieties. Uh, abandonment anxiety and engulfment anxiety. This is known in, in psychology as a repetition compulsion. It's repeating a pattern of behavior that is dysfunctional, leads to bad outcomes, but you can't stop yourself from doing it again and again. So approach avoidance is a repetition compulsion, which is very common in, in the borderline. And in both borderlines and narcissists, finally acknowledged by the DSM after decades of debate, there is a deficit of empathy. We used to think erroneously that borderlines have a lot of empathy and narcissists have no empathy. We now know better. Uh, I was the first to describe empathy in narcissists. I, I coined the phrase cold empathy. Narcissists do have empathy, but they have no emotional resonance with the empathy. They have no emotional correlate. Narcissists and psychopaths must have empathy because otherwise, how will they abuse people? How will they con people? How will they cheat people and deceive them if you don't have empathy? You need to really read people well to do this. But at the same time, you need to have zero emotional reaction to it. So that's narcissists and psychopaths. Others have been claiming, not me for a change, have been claiming that borderlines are the same. They don't have empathy. Oh, they've reduced empathy. And for many decades there was a raging debate. And now the DSM accepted this. That there is a reduction in empathy in, in borderline. Another reason to think that all these disorders are actually one and the same. Only with different coping strategies, that's all. Now, when you put everything together, approach avoidance, introject inconstancy, object inconstancy, etc., lack of empathy, when you put all this together, it's clear that in intimate relationships, there would be massive problems with attachment. Borderlines and narcissists have insecure attachment style. We distinguish between secure attachment and insecure attachment. Secure attachment, I think there are three people in the world that have it, and they all live in Kathmandu. The rest of the population um, has insecure attachment, <laughs> my, my practice at least. And um, they are not statistic actually, strangely. Insecure attachment is fear of intimacy, another name for fear of intimacy. So you could be fearful, you could have a fearful attachment style, you could have an avoidant attachment style, you could have a dismissive attachment style, which is to be rude and reject people and so on. There are numerous types of um, insecure attachment styles. There are actually four basic ones, but you can combine them. So permutations are about 16 or 20. Insecure attachment styles. And borderlines and narcissists have insecure attachment styles because they don't have the first rudiment of attachment. They don't have what it takes. They don't even have one out of four or one out of six elements. They have nothing, like zero. So they cannot attach. Now, the narcissist compensates for a lack of attachment with a fantasy defense. Narcissism, pathological narcissism, is a fantasy defense. The diagnostic criteria open with the word, the pattern of fantasy. It's a fantasy defense, not fantasy, it's a defense mechanism. First described by Freud, of course, where is it? Fantasy is a defense mechanism. And what the narcissist does 
he uses fantasy in everything, and especially in his intimate relationships. He creates a shared fantasy, and he invites the intimate partner into the shared fantasy. You are very wise, you are very wise to live now, before I invite you to my shared fantasy. So, the narcissist compensates for insecure attachment by offering the intimate partner a fantasy, inviting her into the fantasy, and then inhabiting the fantasy together. And within the fantasy, the intimate partner is being transformed dramatically. Very dramatically, actually. The borderline solution is also a shared fantasy. But while the narcissist shared fantasy is a type of cult, we against the world kind of fantasy, the borderline fantasy is we are one. I'm one with my intimate partner. There's no, no, no daylight between us. We're a single organism with two heads. No? And the narcissist fantasy is it's just you and me because we are so special, both of us. We are so special. So it's just you and me against the world that is hostile, doesn't understand us, and so on. That's the essence of the narcissist shared fantasy. I mentioned dissociation. Dissociation, and, and you see that I don't have time to touch on these topics at length, but each and every one of these topics, if you go on, on my YouTube channel, and make me even richer, on, on this channel, each and, each and every, every single thing I've mentioned is like two, three, four videos, um, a total of anywhere between four and ten hours, analysis and so on. And the reason the videos are so long is that I love to hear my voice. <laughs> I've been totally honest with you today, and you don't appreciate it. Okay. Dissociation has three forms. One is called amnesia, forgetting. One is called depersonalization, the feeling that whoever is performing actions or acts is not you. Autopilot, observing yourself from outside as though you're an observer. Movie, there's a movie with you as an actress, just watching. Derealization, which is the third form of dissociation, is when the whole environment is perceived as unreal. Whatever is happening is perceived as unreal, dreamlike, like marriage, fantasy-like, and so on and so forth. Dissociation is a classic outcome of trauma. And so if I'm right, and others are right, and narcissism and borderline are post-traumatic states, we should find a lot of dissociation. And indeed, one of the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder is dissociation. Similarly, narcissists dissociate a lot. They cover up for the dissociation with something called confabulation. Confabulation looks a lot like lying, but it's not lying because the narcissist believes in it. It's just the narcissist trying to make sense of the memory gaps. and says, well, I must have done this. It stands to reason that I've done this. Uh, it probably happened this way. And then he repeats the story, and then he begins to believe the story. And then he would fight you tooth, nail, and claw if you try to challenge the story. And then other people say the narcissist is a liar. It's not a liar. It's a desperate attempt to paper over the memory gaps. Both these disorders are highly, highly discontinuous. Now, I've developed a model called the self-state model. It's based on the work of Philip Romberg. And I'm not going to it right now. Thank you. I will go into it right now. I similarly developed a second model called IPAN, uh, Intrapsychic Activation Model. Those of you who want to learn more about the self-state model and the IPAN, Intrapsychic Activation Model, just go on my channel, type the keywords, and you will receive uh, an advertisement for Coke. <laughs> I think, if you're lucky. I will really not go into it right now, although it's critical for the, for the understanding of that. I will finish and let you ask questions by describing um, 
So I developed three models. So two, two I've just mentioned. The third model that I've developed um, combines all the info, all the knowledge we have about personality disorders and allows us to predict new personality disorders or states that resemble personalities. So in my in my model, I distinguish between overt, covert, and collapsed states. We have an overt narcissist, that's Donald Trump. We have a covert narcissist, who should remain unnamed, and we have um, a collapsed narcissist. That's a narcissist who fails to obtain supply. He cannot obtain supply, so he collapses. He falls apart. So there are these three states. There are two effects in my model. One is shame, and one is envy. There are two reality principles, people who confuse ex internal objects with external objects, and people who confuse external objects with internal objects. This, this I will explain a bit. I will dwell on it because it's very important. A psychotic state involves a principle of action, a mechanic of the soul, known as hyperreflexivity or hyperreflection. Hyperreflexivity is that the psychotic mind expands outwards and becomes the world. Because the psychotic has no boundaries, no limits, he, the psychotic doesn't know where he ends and the world begins. He doesn't know actually that he ends and the world begins. He doesn't make these distinctions. So as the psychotic expands outwards, a little like the Big Bang, yeah, it creates a universe. At that moment, psychotic is unable to tell the difference between objects inside his mind, internal objects, and objects out there, external objects. Because the distinction is meaningless if, as the song says, we are the world. <laughs> if you are the world, what's the meaning of internal, external? There's no such thing. Right? Right. Right? Because I, I said it. So, <laughs> from that moment on, the psychotic confuses internal and external. So, he has a voice in his head, it's coming from the city. He sees something in his mind, it's standing in the corner, in the corner. He doesn't make this. So this is an extreme case. The narcissist is not very far from it, shockingly. That's not some button, that's Otto Kernberg. The narcissist is not very far from it. The narcissist confuses external objects with internal objects. It's like mirror psychosis, reverse psychosis. I remind you, the psychotic confuses internal objects and thinks that they are external. The narcissist thinks that external objects are actually internal. No, it's not perfect. Um, so for example, when the narcissist comes across a potential intimate partner, a second example. He would look at her, he would take a snapshot of her, take a photo of her, literally, a snapshot. And then he would internalize the snapshot. It would become an internal object. That minute the snapshot becomes an internal object. From that, from the moment the internal object is created, the narcissist continues to interact only with the internal object, not with the external object. All interactions henceforth are with the internal object. But he is confused. He thinks the internal object actually stands in for the external object. He believes, in other words, that the external object is actually internal. So when the external object begins to behave independently, challenge the narcissist, disagree with him, travel starts start to study in Covinus University, um, have new friends. When this happens, there's a gap opening between the snapshot and the partner. She becomes independent and she changes, but the snapshot is static, stable. So there's a gap opening. This creates huge anxiety in the narcissist, enormous anxiety. And then he has to devalue the partner in order to regain on your status. But it's important to understand that narcissism is a form of psychosis. It's, a rever it's reverse psychosis. Simply. It's psychosis is internal-external, narcissism is external-internal. 
with the borderline, the situation is even more complicated. Again, that's not some button, that's autocomic. That's why it's called borderline. Border, on the border between psychosis and neurosis. So, with the borderline situation, it's even more complex. Remember that the narcissist can create a snapshot and internalize it, and then you are his forever, or you. But the borderline is incapable of doing even this. You remember when you were much younger, I told you about introject inconstancy? <laughs> you find introject inconstancy funny? No, I find that like half an hour ago I was much younger. <laughs> so, while the narcissist has refuge, can find refuge in a stable, a stable harem, if you wish, a stable representation of internal objects, he feels safe among these internal objects. He knows how to manipulate them, he can interact with them, they can give him solace and presence and so on. The borderline can't do even this. She can't do even this. Her only, the only way for the borderline to feel safe regulated and so on, with a secure base, is to literally maintain the physical presence of her intimate partner. She needs him captive, absolute prisoner, 24-7, every second, dead or alive, asleep or awake. She needs him by her side. So her dependency on the, on the intimate partner is total. Total, because if he's gone, not only is he gone, but her mind is gone. He's taking her mind with him. She doesn't have a representation of him in her mind. So, she's hysterical. She's absolutely hysterical about his presence. And she reacts even to imaginary abandonment. Even to anticipated abandonment. Even to, she, she interprets many things, misinterprets many things, many behaviors as abandonment. Because for her, abandonment, abandonment means dying. Dying, literally. Be, becoming mindless, without a mind. You could say that the borderline outsources her mind to her intimate partner. And he can abscond with it. He can just walk away with it. Imagine how terrifying this is. What the narcissist does, he internalizes you. He converts you into an avatar character action figure in his mind and then he doesn't care about you anymore he plays video games with you in his mind you know, he shoots at you and etc so the narcissist has it more easy more easy than the borderline and these are gradations of course there's the borderline then there's the narcissist these are gradations and the psychotic underlies them all that is why Kerberg said these are pseudo-psychotic state. They are near psychosis. And he was absolutely right in my view. So this is, the, these are the two reality principles, confusing external with internal, internal with external. I have two traumatic bridges in my model. This is my third model. There are two I did not discuss, discuss in the last one. The two traumatic bridges are collapse and mortification. Collapse, I, I mentioned, is when the narcissist cannot obtain supply or when the borderline cannot ensure the continued presence of her intimate partner. These are collapse states. When there is a collapse, there is a transition from one type to another. So when the narcissist collapses, he switches from overt to covert. When, and, and, and back, from covert to overt. And he can also switch from somatic to cerebral. Uh, when the borderline uh, collapses, she would also switch between states of borderline, which I, I was the first to describe, covert borderline and so on. So they're switching between types. Mortification is much, much more stable, much more difficult. In the case of the narcissist, mortification is public humiliation in front of peers or significant others that is sudden, unexpected, and that involves the destruction of a shared, shared fantasy. So the destruction of a shared fantasy in public, in front of meaningful others, and which involves shame and humiliation. 
that modification, narcissistic modification was first described, my memory doesn't fail me, in 1957. Um, and it is, the narcissist is like dying. It's as close as I can describe it. It feels like dying. And it is very life threatening. Very life threatening. The borderline goes through modification, but the borderline's modification is private. It is the outcome of abandonment that is final, uh, intentional, with intention, malice, malicious, final, and abandonment that kind of takes away her ability to find another intimate body. So this would be modification in borderline. Modification states uh, lead to paralysis. Collapse states lead to transition from type to type. Modification states paralyze completely. Why? Because all the defenses are disabled. The narcissist's false self and the borderline's false self, they both have false selves, by the way. The, the false self of the narcissist and the borderline are disabled by modification. He has no defenses left. Both of them then, the narcissist becomes actually borderline. Modification renders the narcissist borderline because he has no defenses, a process called decompensation. The narcissist decompensates. He has no defenses and he begins to dysregulate heavily. He becomes borderline. When the borderline is subject to modification, she becomes a secondary psychopath. That's the most recent for the kind of cutting edge research. She becomes a secondary psychopath, a factor two psychopath. That's a psychopath with a modicum of empathy and a lot of emotion. So, in both cases, there is a massive transformation. Now, there was a guy called Grotstein, psychoanalyst, who said that borderlines are failed narcissists. The child exposed to abuse and trauma, child attempts to become a narcissist. But when the child fails, the child remains a borderline lifelong borderline. So obviously, if the narcissist is regressed by modification, he will reg regress to the previous stage, which is borderline. So it's like abuse, borderline, narcissist. And back, narcissist, borderline because of abuse, the modification. This constant back and forth regression between uh, developmental stages it happens to the narcissist inside and the borderline dozens of times in a lifetime. Dozens of times. So these bridges are very important because they facilitate change and, and transformation and so on. And finally, in my model, there are three cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are not cognitive deficits. Cognitive deficit is a problem with cognition, usually organic problem, with condition. A cognition, I'm sorry. Problem with thinking, epistemic problem. Um, cognitive distortion is not, there's no problem with your cognition, but there's a filter that changes the information that's coming in in a highly specific way. So grandiosity is a cognitive, it's kind of a filter or membrane. You know? Grandiosity is a cognitive distortion. Because I would, the narcissist would take all the information and then fit it into a grandiose, fantastic narrative. So this is, you will distort it to, to fit into the narrative. It's a kind of reframing. Uh, grandiosity and then dissociation is a cognitive distortion. And paranoia. Someone asked about paranoia. Who was the paranoia here? You? Right. <laughs> paranoia is a cognitive distortion. And why do I mention paranoia in the context of narcissism and borderline? First of all, you should know that borderlines are grandiose, exactly like narcissism. They both have grandiosity. I'm mentioning paranoia because paranoia is narcissism. What does the paranoia say? Paranoid say? He says, I'm the center of a conspiracy. They're out to get me. I'm sufficiently important to warrant the attention of the CIA. You know? So it is a self-aggrandizing narrative. Otherwise, how can you be a paranoid? Paranoid means they're out to get me. Me. Out to get me. <laughs> because I am substantial and consequential. So it's a form of narcissism, actually. That's why I'm mentioning paranoia as a cognitive, a cognitive distortion. 
I try to give you really, because the field is vast, and I could talk for several days. I do actually talk for several days. People, you know, they have tents and camper vans, <laughs> and uh, catering services go by, and popcorn, and this kind of thing. I have seminars that last eight hours, eight, eight days, uh, up to 16 hours a day. So I warn you, I can talk a lot. But having said, having frightened you this way, I try to give you a foretaste, a kind of you know, sampling of what's going on today in the field, the debates we're having, the arguments, what, what we agree on, what we, do, what we don't agree on. Of course, I've overemphasized my contributions, goes without saying. And, uh, and so on, but the field is in ferment. There is a lot, a lot going on uh, today. We are even disputing the very concept of personality, and the very concept of identity, or identity. And that is my model, the IPA model, the intercyclic activation model, actually disputes um, these concepts. They, they're counterfactual in, in this model. So there's a lot going on. Psychology is a very you try to shoot me. <laughs> Starts with chairs, you know, then guns. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, psychology is a very exciting field now. I think more than ever, actually. I've been in this field for three decades. Um, and I know the field intimately from its beginning. I've read a lot and so on. I think this is possibly the most exciting period that's ever been in psychology. I regret that psychologists are trying to be physicists. I'm a physicist also, so I can compare. I regret that they're trying to be physicists. It's custom, not in a good way. And the more they try to be physicists, the more pseudo-scientists they become. And that's very regrettable. But there's always a hardcore, the likes of me, who try to you know, get rid of the pretensions to science and just focus on human beings and how they operate, and what can we learn from them, and how we can observe them without, without affecting them, and so on and so forth. So, psychology is, is a branch of literature. Dostoevsky was a great psychologist, possibly the greatest ever, yeah, as great as Freud, definitely. Freud was a literary genius, not exactly a rigorous scientist, despite his training as a neurologist. Seven of the ten most important psychologists until the end of the 1960s were not psychologists at all. Melanie Klein did not have any degree in psychology. Winnicott was a pediatrician. Freud was a neurologist. So psychology was a much more open field because it did not pretend to be a science. And consequently, until the 1960s, there was a flourishing of psychology, the likes of which has never happened since. What we have been doing since then is narrowing psychology, narrowing the statistics and laboratories and white coats. Money has a lot to do with it, because if you look like a physicist, you pretend to be a physicist and you use mathematics that no congressman can understand, you get money. You'll take money for grants and research. And so. But that's not psychology. It's not psychology. It's unconscionable that in many universities, including in Europe recently, statistics is about 40% of the curriculum. It's extremely lucrative. I happen to be a physicist with specific training, training in mathematics. I can tell you, statistics is what you want it to be. So, I wouldn't have chosen statistics as the tool and I, if I were forced to choose any branch of mathematics, I'm not sure I would have chosen statistics. It's a mess. It's simply a mess. And those of us who are trying to reintroduce a human dimension and aspect, a literary aspiration into the field, we are rebuffed. We are considered clowns because we don't come, come up with statistics or numbers or, or whatever. And that is bad news for psychology. They discarded the baby with the bathwater, with the bathtub, with the bathroom, with the apartment, with the entire building and with two cities to go. So nothing much is left. Today it's forbidden to teach. Anything before 1960. Anything. You can't teach, for example, object relations theory. Anyone. 
simply forbidden. Of course you can't mention Freud. Mention Freud, you're out. You just can't mention. Um, it's lamentable. I fit in because I know I know statistics and mathematics. I teach I teach in the outreach program of Princeton and Yale, so okay. I survived. But I survived against my will. That's I'm so disheartened by this that I'm seriously thinking of doing the field. This is really on the other hand there's a lot of creative thinking going on. So maybe it's fight worth fighting for those of you who are whose age is not three digits like me. Okay, ladies and some gentlemen, uh, if you have any questions, if you have any answers, I'll be happy to question. <laughs> Someone send me a list, I mean, uh, just send me a list of questions. Where are you? Who asked this question? And not you asked all these questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I asked some. Did any of you have questions that she replicated, she copied? But I got it from other ladies. So. From other? Those who were clever enough not to attend. Okay. I have one question. Yes. Um, sometimes the Nazis use uh, silent treatment. And what does it mean? Silent treatment. And uh, which is the, what is the reason behind it? Silent treatment is oppression. It's also part of the process known as intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement is hot and cold. Love hate. Um, intermittent reinforcement creates dependency on the source of the reinforcement. So if someone is hot and cold with you, when he's cold, you would wait for the hot, for the hot. He becomes the sole source for the hot. So silent treatment is part of this cycle, and it's a form of aggression. And uh, it is intended to communicate via silence. Um, all kinds of messages. It's supposed to modify your behavior, it's supposed to question and cause you to question your reality. So it's an integral part of gaslighting, question your reality. It's supposed to affect you, regulate your moods and, and emotions in a way that would create dependency by automatic reinforcement. So it has multiple functions. It's a very cruel thing. I think it's one of the most cruel forms of abuse because your imagination is doing the abuse. There's nothing out there. It's your imagination that is trying to why is he doing this? What did I do to him? What did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? So it's self-torture. provokes self-torture. That's very cruel. Right? Are they aware of this feminism? Like this public call? Narcissists are aware of their behaviors, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, they just don't see it as a pathology. They don't think it's seen. And most of them are proud. They're proud that they are like that. They reframe their behaviors as something to be proud of. So they say, for example, I'm tough. I'm the next stage in evolution. People are inferior to me. If everyone was like me, things would be much better. And so on and so forth. So they affect, they invest emotional energy in their disorder. They fall in love with their disorder. They get attached to it. And they idealize it because narcissists idealize everything. Narcissists idealize it himself his intimate partner, his work, his government, his football club. So he idealizes his disorder also. Idealization is a natural reaction of the narcissist because a narcissist is, is a fantasy defense. And to be able to have a fantasy, you need first to idealize the participants of the fantasy. Because you can't have a fantasy with people who are imperfect, flawed, stupid, ugly. You need to, your fantasy should be perfect. It's a fantasy about perfection. So the narcissist idealizes everyone and everything. For a while. Sorry? And for a while. Because after a while they, they just idealize the other person. Yes, there are other dynamics. In, in, in romantic relationships, in intimate relationships, the narcissist partner is a mother figure. So he needs to get rid of his mother. He didn't complete the separation with his original mother. So he wants to complete it with the mother substitute. 
and then he needs to devalue her, and he needs to discount her. This is a symbolic separation. So he is doing it to symbolize the separation. But um, he idealizes everything. And yes, he tends to devalue and discard the things that he's idealized and move on, but it's always a fantasy. Always there's a fantasy. Classes don't live in reality at all. They're not in reality. And very often, narcissist fantasies appeal to so many people that they become, for example, leaders, political leaders. Because they are able to create a shared fantasy for millions. Fantasy is very appealing because reality sucks. I don't know if you, how many of you noticed, but reality sucks. It's breaking news from CNN. So, fantasy is very, very attractive, very appealing proposition. Narcissists are masters of fantasy. Who can resist them? No one can. So we are living in an increasingly more narcissistic civilization. Society, because reality is becoming less and less bearable. And what alternative do we have? We can commit suicide. Suicide rates are going up among certain age groups. We can uh, kill ourselves while being alive. So substance abuse is skyrocketing. We can keep ourselves mentally so depression is up five times and anxiety disorders are up three times than 40 years ago. We can isolate ourselves so we are as good as dead because we don't see anyone and no one sees us. In 1980, a typical person in the United States had 10.1 good friends. I don't know what is the zero one good friend. 10.1 good friends. So, I don't want to speculate. If it's, a male, if it's a male, I know. So, yes. Yeah, you may move the chair. So, I know you want to. I can see it. Can see it. So, um, in 1980, uh, the person in the United States with 10.1 friends in 2018, 0.9. It's a form of dying. You isolate yourself with two kids and one Netflix, or two Netflix and one kid, and you're essentially dead. You're dead for all intents and purposes. If at the same time you also abuse substances, and so on and so forth. And of course, slow suicide. Not everyone has the willpower or the courage to commit suicide outright, but there are numerous ways to do it and they're becoming more and more and more prevalent in, in today's society. The society, reality is such that fantasy has become irresistible and reified in technology. So we have fantasy-based technologies today. They're all fantasy-based. We have, we are about to have the metaverse. The metaverse is 100% fantasy. It's like you're going to disappear into a computer screen and never exit literally never exit, because you could order food, you could work, you could, excuse the expression, have sex, you could do anything within the metaverse. And you would never exit. Well, that's total fantasy. And of course it's reminiscent of the Matrix. Matrix is a fantasy system. Is it bad? There are people like, for example, the philosopher David Chalmers, who says that, no, it's not bad. Uh, if we can survive in fantasy, or in a simulation, what is the distinction between this and reality? Why, is reality? why does reality have a privileged status? He says, why should it have a privileged status? If you spend all your life attached to a computer screen or in a matrix, and then you die, you wouldn't even know that it's not real. You would think it's real. Simulation would be convincing. Fantasy would be over overwhelming, overpowering. So, what's a big deal? Why do you have to be? based in reality, asks David Chalmers. The answer is that first of all, if you're not in reality, you're not self-efficacious. Well, some of the outcomes will go against you. You will not succeed to obtain results. Some, not all. But much more importantly, a fantasy defense always leads to narcissism. When a fantasy defense becomes exaggerated, it always invariably results in narcissism. End of story. There's no other outcome. That's why 
studies by Twenge and Campbell shows, show that the incidence of narcissism, pathological narcissism, among college students is up by almost 500%. In other words, pathological narcissism among college students has, qu has quintupled in less than four decades. Why? Because they are much more exposed to fantasy. And because our parents. Parents, parents, the parents doesn't doesn't often actually result in, in narcissism. But narcissism, when you react to parents like that, when you react to such parents in the fantasy defense, then you become narcissistic. And we are creating a narcissistic civilization because we are placing huge emphasis and a lot of money on fantasy. That's where we're going, where we're going to end it. In a narcissist shared fantasy. Believe me, it's the worst place imaginable to be. It's hell. It's absolute hell. So, yes. Well, uh, I am someone familiar with your work and it really resonates with me for a reason. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask so, you talked a lot about what leads to narcissism. Do you personally know? Anyone, or maybe not personal, an anecdotal is fine with me, uh, who has ever overcome narcissism in a way that is not just that they are functional uh, or they act kinder, but that they genuinely feel different? Or maybe, like, have you overcome your own narcissism ever? No. Because it's a known fact that you've always used channel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very tempted to say yes. <laughs> but I promise to be truthful. Um, you see, this leads to a problem known as the intersubjectivity problem. Do we really have access to another person's mind? Of course we don't. We have to rely 100% on self-reporting. If you cry and I ask you why do you cry, the obvious answer you are you've been listening to me for two hours. There is a reason to cry. But it could be that you're sad over something. I have to rely on your self-report. I have to rely on what you tell me. There is no other way. So if you are a truthful person, and even there I have to rely on you, I mean, how would I know if you're truthful? And ultimately, it, it all relies on self-reporting, because if I ask your friend, is she truthful? They also rely on her self-reporting. So there's no end to this. This is called the intersubjectivity problem. We cannot access another person's mind. So what we do, we lie. We create a big lie. We pretend. We pretend that because we share the same uh, physiology, we also, also share the same structure of mind and processes of mind and so on and so forth. There is no way to prove this. Consequently, there's no way for me to answer your question. I don't know what is happening inside the narcissist's mind. I have to rely on his self-reporting, which is a practice I strongly discourage <laughs> in the case of narcissists. One of the big, my biggest criticism, there's a test for psychopathy. It's called PCLR. The main test for psychopathy is called PCLR. So the PCLR has two parts. One of them is asking the psychopath questions. The second part, is asking the psychopath's wife and children questions. Okay, how it goes. The psychopath, we all know, is one of the most truthful people on earth. He would never lie. He would never misrepresent himself. Psychopaths are very truthful. So the first part of the test is to ask the psychopath, did you ever torture animals? Me? No. I? Never. Did you ever steal something from another person? No. I'm very moral. I would never do this. And then you ask his wife, who is probably terrified of him, is he a good man? Of course he's a good man, great, he's the best man ever. And you ask his children, who he beats twice a day, if, uh, you know, this is the test. I'm kidding you not. That's the main test for psychology. So we have to rely on self-reporting. So the answer to the first part of the question is there's no way of knowing if there's been any real transformation in anyone, let alone analysis. It's important in analysis. 
So why However, because they modify behaviors. They want to be more, more self-efficacious. The only reason narcissist, a narcissist goes to therapy is because he thinks he can maximize the outcomes. He is not doing it well enough. He actually comes to therapy to learn how to be a more efficient narcissist. He wants, to, he, he wants the therapist to take away the things that affect his function and performance. So, yes, we do know how to modify the behaviors of narcissists. We know how to modify behaviors. We know how to render narcissists less antisocial, less abrasive, less unpleasant, um, easier to live with. We know how to teach narcissists to do this. Sometimes we use their grandiosity, we challenge them, let's see if you can do it, and so on. We know how to do it, and this part works successfully. But the core issues absolutely are untouched. Shared fantasy for them. I'm 62, a professor of psychology, prestigious universities. I contributed to the field. And I repeat the same pattern with every woman I meet. Shared fantasy. And then she abandons me, she cheats on me, I'm mortified, I want to die, take six months, I recover, having learned all my lessons, I repeat everything again. It's not learning the process. So this is the this is the, the thing we face. We can modify behaviors. Now I invented a, a new treatment model called therapy. And cold therapy allows me to destroy some parts of the of the apparatus, some parts of the machinery of narcissism. Mainly the false self. You can destroy the false self. There's no need for narcissistic supply, and the grandiosity is gone. But these are not the core issues of the narcissist. These are, these are the issues that bother society. But the emptiness, it doesn't go away. Emptiness doesn't go away. The need for fantasy, the fantasy defense doesn't go away. The lack of empathy doesn't go away. The damage done to intimate partners doesn't go away. None of this goes away. So who more intended to cheat? Narcissist or borderline? Borderline is more prone to acting out and promiscuity, reckless behaviors, not only promiscuity, drinking and so on. So there are no statistics, but the borderline overall is more likely than the narcissist mm -hmm. to cheat. Narcissists also, as opposed to what you, what you watch online and so on, narcissists have an island of stability. So usually you have a narcissist who has been married for 40 years and has kids and grandkids and so on, but he has changed 20 jobs. Or you have a guy who's working in the same company since he was 16, and he's now the chief executive officer 57 years later, but in the meantime, he got ma uh, married, remarried, and divorced nine times. So there's an island of stability surrounded by a portion of chaos. This is the, it's a good description of the open us. Maybe you could read the questions. Um, yes. And I have another question. Who, it was on a list that, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of those people have very shallow effect and emotions, or most of them. And is it connected to the lack of consciousness they have, or like of yeah. con conscience, or remorse they feel? So how remorse is connected to feelings? Because maybe we think it's a moral issue, but um, these people cannot really feel deep and cannot attach to people, so that's why it's hard for them to feel remorse. Is it connected or it's just, I don't know, so morality and feelings are connected or not? Shallow effect is mo much more typical of uh, psychopaths. Mm -hmm. And even I suggested that psychopaths have flat effect. Mm -hmm. Shallow effect is also linked to something called reduced effect display. Reduced effect display is not showing emotions, poker face, not reacting emotionally to any changes in the environment. This is typical of psychopaths, not narcissists. Mm -hmm. Narcissists can and often are very animated. Mm -hmm. uh, they imitate or mimic emotions very much. They don't experience positive emotions. Narcissists have no access to positive emotions of any kind, so they cannot love, for example. Narcissists cannot love. But they do have access to negative affect affectivity. Negative affectivity are negative emotions, like envy, anger, mm -hmm. rage. 
they have access to it, and they experience these emotions very powerfully. Uh, so it's not true to say that narcissists have shallow affect. Mm -hmm. They have what we call negative affectivity. Mm -hmm. Negative affectivity is half the spectrum of emotions. It is felt very powerfully, very strongly, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly actually. So in this sense, mm -hmm. they are like negative borderlines. Mm -hmm. They are like borderlines, but they are overwhelmed only by negative emotions. A borderline can be overwhelmed by love, for example, or what she thinks is love. But a narcissist will never be overwhelmed by love because he does not experience love. But he will be overwhelmed by anger, mm -hmm. and he will do crazy things. He will lose impulse control. He will be reckless. He will destroy himself and everyone around him. So in this sense, he is like a negative borderline. Remorse and regret, they are linked to two underlying emotions, shame, shame and guilt. I refer you to the works of Masterson. Narcissism, many scholars believe that narcissism is a shame reaction. The child was shamed by the parent. The child felt, felt ashamed that he's unable to cope with the parent. And so to compensate for this shame, the child became a narcissist. But the narcissist doesn't dare to touch his shame. In mortification, in mortification, the narcissist is humiliated, he's shamed. So he gets in touch with his shame. That's why he becomes borderline and suicidal, because he's in touch with the shame. I've been mortified several times in my life, twice in the last three years. So I went through mortification twice in the last three years. I am clinically mortified as I speak to you right now. I'm in a mortified state right now as I speak. So, it's a little like, uh, it's a lot like, you know, a lot like dying, a lot like, a lot like falling apart, disintegrating. And it is because I, I got in touch with the, with the underlying reservoir of shame that gave rise to the narcissism. It's as if I lost my narcissism defense and I became a child all over again and a child who experiences the full power of the shame that is inside you. Child is defenseless, of course, against the shame. That's why there is suicide radiation and so on. So, shame and guilt, the narcissist doesn't dare to experience shame and guilt because it would be life-threatening. Consequently, he's incapable of remorse, regret, and so on. But everything you said is more typical of psychopaths, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is another question, yes, that... Um, after survival of the modification? The narcissist reacts to modification by becoming a borderline in effect. A suicidal borderline, to be more precise. A suicidal borderline. And then he begins to, there are two ways to react. You can watch it on my channel. There are two ways to react. One is called external, and one is called internal. External reaction to modification is to say, these people are evil, they wanted to get me. The horrible people, I was a victim, and so on. And the internal, the internal reaction to mortification is, I made it happen. I pushed them to do it. I, I engineered the whole thing. I was the puppet master. I was in control. So this restores the grandiosity. In both cases, it restores the grandiosity. Because in the external mortification, you're a victim. So you're the good guy. You're morally upright. You are. So the grandiosity locus is in your morality, the victim. And in the other solution, you're godlike. You're the puppet master. You make them do it. So uh, these are the two solutions to modification. It takes time, these narratives, because they're not very convincing. So you have to you have to deceive yourself as a narcissist. You have to deceive yourself into believing them. Now if you're not highly intelligent, it takes a shorter period of time. But if you are highly analytic, like me, I'm highly analytic. I have enormous difficulty to, to accept either of the two solutions because I know they don't sit well with all the facts. So I'm, I'm struggling with multiplication much longer than a typical narcissist. Much longer. And the risk to my life is much enhanced than in a typical narcissist because of my intelligence and analytical skills. So intelligence is not always an asset in process. Not always. Is this something that 
Phototherapy creates modification. Phototherapy is a, is a process of creating artificial modification, controlled modification. And then through the modification, you bring the narcissist out of it. So in the first few days of phototherapy, there is extreme suicidal ideation. And I need to I need to be with the patient in the same room or the same apartment. If the patient is good looking, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so so uh, it's it's simulated modification. So, so I came to this insight of cold therapy because I've been modified before and I, I realized the only window, the only window to change is modification. All the defenses are down, uh, there's a risk of suicide, the narcissist is terrified. He's like a child again. Clinically, developmentally, the narcissist is about two years old in when he's in modification. So talking to him now is a two year old. Clinically, developmentally. Generally, by the way, even in normal, normal life, the narcissist is about two years old as far as emotional literacy, emotional intelligence, ability to interact as a narcissist. Narcissism is a form of arrested development. It's a regressive state. That's Freud, that's not that. <laughs> it's a regressive state. And so, narcissists are children, absolute children. And they are more or less, in some respects, two years old, in other respects, six years old. The very developed narcissists, the, the least affected, are nine years old. But you will never find any narcissist above nine years old. None. And the vast majority of them are two. Now, they usually disguise it because they have skills, they have education, they have a blue sweater, you know, they, they know how to disguise it. But under conditions of extreme stress, decompensation, mortification, the blue sweater falls, and many other things, and what is left is a, a terrified two-year-old who has to cope head on with a replay or reenactment of the original trauma with his mother and the shame attached to that trauma, the helplessness, the helplessness attached to it. Helplessness provokes shame. When you're helpless, it's very shameful. You feel humiliated. It's humiliating. So imagine you're my age, but you're experiencing the emotions of a two-year-old who is terrified, humiliated, ashamed, and totally helpless. Of course it pushes to suicide. It's a very dangerous condition. Many shared fantasies end in mortification. Many shared fantasies end in mortification because the narcissist, if the narcissist chooses the wrong intimate partner, the interplay of the pathologies leads to defiance. The other partner defies the narcissist and then she wants to hurt the narcissist. So, for example, if the narcissist teams up with um, a psychopath, his partner, his intimate partner is a psychopath. Or even a borderline who is very frequently in a psychopathic state. Mm -hmm. Now there are new studies, re relatively new studies, that show that there is a there are all borderlines become psychopathic when they are exposed to, to abandonment and rejection. But some borderlines are way more psychopathic than other borderlines. And they are comorbid. So they have psychopathy and we call it. This is the typical partner of the narcissist. The narcissist goes for psychopathic borderline. At least this narcissist <laughs> goes for psychopathic borderline, and then the potential for modification is enormous because she would reject and resent being transformed into a figment of a fantasy. She would insist on her autonomy and defiance. She would be defiant. And, out, and, and finally, she would create what we call a secondary object. She would begin to see the narcissist as an enemy. And she would want to attack the narcissist. She would want to hurt the narcissist. And very often the way she does it is simply cheat on him with another guy in full view, humiliating him in public by doing this. So it ends badly if there is a wrong mate selection. Not all narcissists choose this kind of partner, but many of them do. Modification is most common after the disintegration of an intimate shared fantasy, most of them, like I think 90% of I'm treating 
processes with modification. And uh, from the outside, it's wow. Well, so the ultimate condition is uh, <laughs> I would compare it to schizophrenia. It's really terrifying to, to be old. What was it? There was a question. How can I survive living with a narcissistic person? How can you survive? Why would you want to survive? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to survive with a narcissist? The only thing with a narcissist is to walk away. You don't need to survive. What if you can't walk away? I never bought this. I can't walk I away. I can't walk away because I am the narcissist. What do I do? If you are a narcissist, then uh, the question should be phrased differently. How can I survive as a narcissist? Exactly. Not with a narcissist. Let's first ask this question. There is no situation where you cannot where you cannot walk away. I don't buy the news. I can't walk away because she's my mother. So I haven't spoken to my mother in 26 years. I haven't seen her in 26 years. So I can't walk away because he's my son. So I can't walk away because we have children. You also have an attorney and an accountant. Of course you can walk away. There is no situation where you cannot walk away. This is bullshit. This is because you want to remain in touch with the losses. Somehow. Because there's a vestige of the shared fantasy still vivid and alive in your mind. Because you hope maybe that he will hover you one day, take you back. The, the reasons for staying in touch with the losses are unholy reasons. All of them. So the only solution is no contact. Of course you can manage your life with the Nazis if you insist. But why would you insist? It's sick. It's pathological. Walk away. But which type of person like, can be with Nazis? Which type of personality can be with Nazis? Anyone can be with Nazis. Nazis doesn't care. He, he wants narcissistic supply. So he, Nazis wants four things. They want sex. They want supply. Narcissistic or sadistic, they want services, they want safety. If you give them two or four, two out of four, then you are an intimate partner. But the narcissist prefers, has preference for certain types because they are much, they fit much more easily into the shared fantasy. It takes a lot less work to get them to be in the fantasy. So if I interact with a healthy woman, I would have to work very hard. <laughs> to convince her to enter my fantasy and never exit, because it's not easy. If you, but if you're borderline, you are already in a fantasy state. You're in a fantasy about me, actually. If you're borderline, you're fantasizing about me, because your fantasy is intimate partner centered, centered around the intimate partner. So it's much easier for me to recruit you, to convert you into my fantasy. So I prefer you, of course. Same with codependence. All these, all these uh, mental health disorders, they are one step removed from the narcissist fantasy. While healthy people are ten steps removed. I can get any person to be in my fantasy. Fact. I've done it. But it takes a lot more work with, with a healthy person. Why would I do that? You are saying, you are suggesting that there is a self-aware narcissist, they should reject and avoid all relationships in order to avoid... That's not, that's not a self-aware narcissist, that's a moral narcissist, which is a bit like honest politician. <laughs> so, uh, the decision to abstain from having relationships is a moral decision. It's about not hurting other people. It's not a, it's not a consideration of any narcissist that I know. However, in my case, for example, I decided to be childless. Decided to not have children. So I think it's a moral. I, I'm trying to convince myself it's a moral decision, but probably I just wanted to travel a lot too. <laughs> and, you know, children are serious inconvenience. <laughs> so, but narcissists don't make these calculus. They have a need. They're hungry. They're predators. They're hungry animals. They don't make these calculus. Like, I'm, I've been mortified now. I'm in, in great need of an intimate partner right now. It's a compulsion. I'm compelled to do it. It's not, I don't see it. Here is it. Let me listen to a lecture by Sam Buckley about shared fantasy and, and see if it's okay to recruit an intimate partner. No. I'm, hunt, I'm hunting. 
I'm hunting. I'm a predator, and I need my internet part. I need an internet part because I need to recover from the notification. I need to put myself together again. So it's a, I, the best I can describe it is a compulsion, not not something that the narcissist can control. It's not, it's not a controlled uh, reaction. And after walking uh, away from another narcissist, how many years he tries? How many years he tries to? Yeah. Yeah. It depends how you know. If you mortify the narcissist, you will never do it. If you did not mortify the narcissist, he remains with your introject. Your introject is in his mind. And the introject is always idealized. That's a problem. He devalues you and he discards you. But the introject remains here, idealized. This creates a dissonance. There's a dissonance because the introject is here, is active, and you're gone. So he needs to put you back together with an introject. This process is called re-idealization. He re-idealizes you. Or in clinical terms, he re-affects you. He invests in your emotion. So he re-idealizes you to make you match the, the introject. Make you match the snapshot. And then his dissonance goes down and his anxiety goes down. When you're gone, having discarded you and devalued you, when you're gone, these introjects are active, and they demand uh, demand the correspondence with the outer world. And when it doesn't have this, he is very anxious. The narcissist. So ovary is very common for this reason. He re-idealizes you, and the cycle starts again. So this can uh, create ideas. Narcissist will idealize you, uh, will re-idealize you, and over you. As long uh, at, at any moment where. There are no other introjects mm -hmm. active. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have another intimate partner whose introject is dominant and active, then your introject is still active mm -hmm. and you would need to make the match. That's why narcissists hover in between relationships. Rarely were when they are in relationships. Um, this has been described long before me, of course. This has been described by both the theorists that they're in the and other. This time, uh, country, uh, many others. These dynamics of uh, the, eco the economy of internal objects is very fascinating because it's, it has very big explanatory power. It explains a lot. And so I took it and applied it to narcissism. And it's, I think it explains a lot. Overing is an attempt to silence the interject by matching it up with an external object. And so our external object is you, he needs to idealize you, he re-idealizes you, matches you up with the introject, his anxiety is down, and he's over. And the other question was already mentioned, that how can someone overcome being a narcissist? How can someone overcome being a narcissist? Mm -hmm. That's your question, of course. No, I didn't submit it, but someone else also had the same. It's not a... <laughs> in narcissism, it's not a, it's not a common cold. <laughs> you don't overcome being a narcissist. You can you heal uh, your narcissistic wound? Like, is it possible to overcome the trauma that you were talking about in the beginning? To, to overcome the trauma the that, is at the, yeah, that is at the center of it? Because the childhood trauma is a childhood trauma, it's what we call a formative wound. It's a wound that forms you, a wound that shapes you. It's not, it's not possible to eliminate this wound, or really get rid of it. You are this wound. You are this wound. So that's not the way to go about it. How do you survive with yourself as a narcissist? I hate to be, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but. It's a sentence. It's a life sentence. Narcissism is narcissism is a total solution. While, for example, other disorders are highly specific, narcissism is what the DSM calls all pervasive. It permeates everything. Narcissism affects, narcissism affects everything. Every dimension of your life, every field, every area, every type of function, your cognitions, your emotions, your everything. It's all pervasive. In short, narcissism is you. 
while normally it's not going to say that the disorder is the person. It's not going to say because it's not true. The disorder is the person. In some cases, the disorder is the person. So in both borderline and narcissism, the disorder is the person. And there's no meaning to asking the question, how can I not be a narcissist? It's like asking, how can I not be? So you learn to modify behaviors, become self-aware. If you are, if some narcissists decide that being moral is their grandiosity, they are grandiose by being moral. This is called communal or pro-social narcissism. It's a narcissist who is proud of being moral. So that's his claim to fame. That's his grandiosity. So if you're like that, then yeah, you will not get married, you will not have a relationship, you will not have children, and so on and so forth. And you will publicize this. You will, it will be ostentatious. You will let everyone know what a great person you are. If you have made these personal sacrifices because you realize that you are a narcissist. And this would be this would be your narcissistic supply, your morality. It's possible to reframe yourself this way. It's possible to program yourself this way. People think that grandiosity is about being the best or being the most. That's not true. Grandiosity is about being unique. So for example, you can say, uh, I'm a unique victim. I'm an amazing loser. <laughs> Nobody is a loser like me. No. I, when my company failed, it was the biggest bankruptcy in the history of the United States. <laughs> yeah. So grandiosity can be about failure. can be about anything. So grandiosity is malleable. It's, uh, it's like party. You can play with it. So you can convince yourself, you can program yourself to be grandiose by being altruistic and charitable, and moral. And then, you'll be famous for being moral. You'll be famous for being... So, I, I for example, my grandiosity is that I teach people about narcissism. And many people make the mistake. You don't, you don't have to believe me. Go and see the comments on my video. Everyone say, you can't be a narcissist. No way you're a narcissist. Look, you love people. You teach them. You heal them. I have no idea who they are talking about. <laughs> you know, I leverage my grandiosity. I, I sublimate it. Sublimation is converting a drive or an urge into a socially acceptable form. I sublimated my narcissism, which is pathology, antisocial pathology. I sublimated it into socially acceptable form. And now, the locus of my grandiosity, I am the great teacher. I'm the great teacher because I started all of this. I mean, all the others were teenagers. <laughs> when I started. So I'm the great teacher. That's my grandiosity. That's uh, so it's a win-win. You win, I win, we all win. You can do the same. You can find a win-win formula. So but you will never get rid of who you are. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, are these personality disorders determined? How they are determined? Mm -hmm. I mentioned that it's a childhood abuse. Now, just to clarify why, what I mean by abuse and trauma. When I say childhood abuse and trauma, you see um, a mother beating up a child with a broom, or a broom beating up the mother with a child, or something. So, uh, abuse and trauma are any form, any behavior that violates the child's boundaries and does not allow the child to separate from the parent and become an individual. So, of course, physical abuse violates the child's bodily boundaries. So, it's okay, it's abuse. Sexual abuse violates the child's physical bodily boundaries. So, of course, it's abuse. But, spoiling the child, pampering the child, idolizing the child, pedestalizing the child, they're also forms of abuse. Because the parent doesn't allow the child to be in touch with reality. When you spoil the child or temper the child, you are isolating the child from, rea from a reality and from the consequences of the child's actions. So you're not allowing the child to grow up. People grow up by having friction with reality and by experiencing losses. If you prevent this, if you don't allow the child to do this, then uh, you're abusing the child. 
if you're parentifying the child, you're forcing the child to be a parent figure, that's abusing. If you're using the child as an instrument, that's abusing. So there are many types of abuse. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I have a question about borderline. I know this is something obvious, but what you can define is more obvious than borderline. So what's three main criteria for borderline? I'm sorry, I have a question. Just in short, what's three main criteria for borderline? What is what for borderline? Criteria. Criteria. Criteria for borderline? Criteria. Criteria for borderline include uh, emotional dysregulation. There are nine criteria. They include emotional dysregulation, self-harm, uh, recklessness and impulsivity. Uh, but narcissists also can have like... Narcissists don't self-harm in the same way, physically. Borderlines self-harm physically, the body. Uh, narcissists don't act out. They don't lose it. <laughs> they're not impulsive. Uh, borderlines do. They act out and then they are reckless. They don't protect themselves. So it could be unprotected sex, it could be driving under the influence, it could be spending all your money, all your savings in one day. So they are reckless. And impulse, impulse issues, you go them up, and, uh, and so on. So if I can find the criteria one, these are the main ones that I just mentioned. Okay, you're traumatized enough? <laughs> Okay. If no other questions, then thank you for suffering me. And uh, good night if you can after this. <laughs> and if not, my services are here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.